Hi, everyone. Just before we get going, I want to remind you that everything we talk about and discuss should not be considered as investment advice. The purpose of what we talk about on Catherine Murray Media and Markets on YouTube, as well as Catherine Murray in conversation with on my podcast, should be viewed as informational and entertainment purposes only. Please definitely do your own research, your own homework, and definitely consult an investment professional before making any investment decisions. And also to note, some of us might hold positions in some of the stocks uh, that we discuss. So great to have you with with you. Great to be with you. And let, let's just start there in terms of, um, you know, we've had a nice rally in oil, maybe a little bit of a pullback and a pause. Um, what's your top down view these days? You know, I feel like we've entered into a structural bull market and people are just finally starting to wake up to that. Now, you and I have been chatting for years and I would have held that view. And I, I think the past couple of years, they got really got disrupted by exogenous macro events. Clearly, COVID last year was a massive um, impact on demand temporarily. We've seen demand pretty much come back. Like I would expect we're back to pre-COVID levels by the end of this year, give or take like a million barrels or, or two. But really, the story is on supply. You know, prior to COVID, we'd already seen a massive slowdown in, sh in U.S. shale growth. Um, you know, it peaked in mid-2018, run rate growing over 2 million barrels per day, which was a, a serious issue because that exceeded global demand growth. So then you had, you know, other nations have to see market share. And then ultimately what became a, a price war, so to speak, with OPEC. But really the world or the, the road that we're on now is significantly different than the one that we've been on the past couple of years. U.S. shale growth is largely over. Uh, we can see that through the spending plans. We can see that through the uh, extinguishment of tier one inventory. We can see that through wells marginally getting worse and worse with the passage of time. So that's a huge development because it means that the baton is then passed on to non-OPEC, non-US producers or OPEC, which is a real issue because while OPEC is sitting on some shutting capacity now, which I think they'll be bringing on throughout this year in early 2020 as demand normalizes, They've been living through five plus years of really, really poor pricing. And if you're Saudi, if you're the UAE, so much of your revenue is really uh, relying on oil. And so it's not just that you're an oil company, you know, having to keep production flat and maintaining, but you're having to use that oil revenue for social expenditures. You have to subsidize power, you have to subsidize jobs, you have to subsidize education. And if you don't, you violate that social contract that you have with your populace that you know you do that and they don't go out into the streets and revolt you know there's not a, a, a repeat of arab spring so opec in, in aggregate has not had that ability to increase its capacity beyond that which is shut in so then you'd say well that's fine because we've got canada we've got brazil guyana the north sea etc but we've seen two things happen one is the esg conversation has really really disallowed the, the super majors of growing production. Like it's almost, you know, a criminal act now if they actually invest in new production, they've all mm -hmm. generally speaking pledged, you know, net zero by 2050. And some of them have even said, well, we're gonna let our conventional oil production fall. You know, BP and Royal Dutch Shell is two of the massive companies as they pursue ESG and trying to get back that marginal ESG investor that they've lost over the past couple of years. So when you look at it, US shale growth is over. OPEC will bring on all of their spare capacity this year and early next, so they're out. And then the non-OPEC, non-US producer is at best flatlining, a more likely declining because all of the projects that were sanctioned when oil was at 80, 90, 100 dollars had now been brought on. Like Johan Sverdup was the biggest one. It's a half a million barrel per day project in, in uh, Norway. So there's just the, the depletion of inventory of those super projects to offset you know, a decline rate. And that's the, the great thing with the oil and gas business. You know, anytime things are bad, you know this too shall pass because it's such a massively capital intensive business. If you don't spend a ton of money, you just don't stay flat, you fall. So mm -hmm. there is always this self-corrective mechanism embedded in the oil price. And I just don't think people realize, you know, you, you've got the vocal minority wanting the end of oil. And, you know, I was even, a, I, there was a climate scientist this morning saying that we have to give up our pets because of the carbon, you know, density of dogs and such. So it's, wow. you know, you've, you've got that <laughs> vocal, hopefully minority. Mm -hmm. The reality is, you know, we'll be consuming oil for the rest of your and my lifetime. And we can walk mm -hmm. through that if, if you like. So the role of Canada going forward, I think is really, really exciting. 
And, you know, you look at the backdrop of continued demand growth, you know, there are alternatives, but the runway is so long to reach critical scale to displace the 100, 102 million barrels per day every day that we will be consuming by the end of this year. And yet companies are willingly allowing their production to fall. So, you know, mm -hmm. it is a long-winded answer, but the macro is yeah. we're entering into a supply crisis with the lack of short cycle US supply growth, we're relying on long cycle projects. So rather than four to six months to drill a well and bring on production, we're now having to wait four to six years you know, to bring on a greenfield oil sand project, to bring on a, a large offshore facility off the coast of Guyana or Norway. You know, you're looking four to six years. Mm. So it means that we should be entering into a much longer cycle than we've seen in recent history and it shouldn't be nearly as volatile because, you know, the road we've been on is you get a price spike, four months later, you get a spurt of U.S. shale growth and it kills the rally. Going right. forward, we don't have that. So it's, it's a huge, huge watershed event for the energy industry. That's an interesting way to look at it. It's almost a bit of a paradigm shift because I actually did want to kind of, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in the long term, but I do want to kind of bring you back um, just to the short term to see or to find out what, what have we actually seen though with those shale producers as the price of WTI, you know, surprised probably a lot of people and, and, and rallied despite the COVID-19 pandemic. So what yeah. do we see in terms of new additional supply coming on, whether or not it's long lasting or not, which it doesn't sound like it is from a shale producer perspective, but what do we see mm -hmm. supply side? Yeah, so to, to answer that, we need to talk about the, ba the background of why the business model of shale companies have changed. And it's basically been, there's been hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of shareholder value that has been lost through companies going and pursuing growth for growth sake, because the CEOs themselves were getting paid to do that. And so that's when we saw beginning 2018, the business model shifted because you had growth investors left. They went and bought Tesla, you know, they sold their energy stocks, energy reached a, a pathetic low of like 2.1% of the S&P 500, but they were cheap. And so you had growth in, or value investors come in. And so the value investors, it's taken them two years to beat the CEOs over the head and say, don't pursue growth, pursue economic like returns, underspend your cash flow. Don't spend one and a half times the amount of cash flow you generate a year, spend half that to allow for return of capital dividends and buybacks. So the, the shale companies today are gover governed not just by geology, which we know is degrading. You know, I would say the average shale companies may be sitting on three to five years of good inventory left, which is a huge change. But the governor on growth is their very own shareholders and boards who are saying, we don't want you to grow. We want dividends. We want share buybacks. So we've seen the oil price rally from the beginning of the year. You know, we've gone from, let's say, 52, 53 to about 63 today. So that's a huge change in cash flow. But we've yet to see companies increase their CapEx spending. You know, so I, I think most companies would be, you know, the CEOs would be neutered by the market if they dared meaningfully increase CapEx. It's all about generating free cash flow. What are you going to do with that? If we're in the 70s, which I think we'll be by the end of this year and we roll forward to 2022, and then the question is, okay, if you can spend 70% of your, of your cash flow generated at $70 oil, then what is that growth? And I think we're looking at maybe three to 400,000 barrels per day in the context of what will, I think, once again, be a million barrel per day, you know, growth per annum. So mm -hmm. we've gone from shale satisfying two times demand growth to maybe a half. And the remaining half, I can't tell you where that's going to come from. Hmm. You can't? Uh, where, where do we think it might come from, I wonder? Well, if it comes from Canada, you know, we're looking at, at best, 60,000-ish barrels per day per year of growth. Within OPEC, my theory is, you know, you'll have all of the capacity come online by the end of this year, early 20, 2022, as demand normalizes, and they've exhausted their spare capacity. So my thesis is, in a structurally undersupplied market, you either have to increase supply or kill demand. And my, mm -hmm. my, I think we're going to end up having to kill demand through much, much higher oil prices. And, you, you know, the next question is, well, what oil price does that happen? Like, when does it become too expensive to go on? The road trip with your family to fly in a plane on a vacation all of the discretionary you know elements of, of demand and historically it's been when the the burden on the economy is about six percent of global gdp which would be about 120 to 140 dollars right now hmm. which sounds crazy but we were there before yeah and going forward you know we shale was a blip in the long longer 
uh, you know, the longer scheme of things when it comes mm -hmm. from supply. And, you know, what would it take for Royal Dutch Shell to say, okay, we were wrong. You know, we're not going to pursue offshore wind and solar and, you know, the, the more uh, ESG friendly supposed activities. When do we start sanctioning again? When do we start growing again? And the profit motive has to be so egregious to allow those companies to really, you know, shift from the business strategy that they've just spent the past year really, really strongly vocalizing. Hmm. So it sounds as though the thesis, of course, is this structural de supply side demand, or this, this the, the destruction of supply uh, yeah. could lead to, um, you know, a, a significant output gap. Is that fair? Yes, yes, and significant. We, and in fact, you know, it's, it's being managed now because of the curtailments that we have on the part of OPEC. But going forward, I think we'll go from voluntary curtailments to involuntary, meaning, you know, Shale companies may want to grow while they're governed because of the demands of their shareholders. Uh, the global super majors may want to grow, but they can't because now they're having to allocate investment into renewables. And like BP's already said, well, we're going to allow our production to fall by 30 to 40% over the next decade. Royal Dutch Shell is falling by 1% to 2% per year. So to shift to that would be very, very significant. And so, yeah, I think the outlook for oil is really, really positive. Like, we thought when oil was in, in the 30s last year that we'd reach 50 based upon the work that we do on inventory levels. And, mm -hmm. you know, we were wrong by three days. We hit that Jan 3rd, Jan 4th. Mm -hmm. early, Jan early January, I thought we'd hit 60 by June. And we got there a couple months earlier than, than I thought. But if you look at what OPEC wants, what shale is doing and what demand is doing, I think it brings us to $70 by Q3 of this year. And how much of that is reflected in the current stock valuations yeah because it's we've seen some nice yeah. no not at all no not at all because if you pull up you know longer term charts and there's two factors to that there's the one is you've got the implosion of the oil price and the recovery of that the second has been the multiple derating you know when you know i've been doing this for 18 ish years and we, if we go back to like 2003 2004 when i started you know, companies were trading at three, four times, and then you had multiple expansion to seven to eight. And that's kind of where we were hanging out. And now with the capital exodus, for a variety of reasons, I can buy names now trading at two to two and a half times cash flow, or a better metric is free cash flow. And I can buy companies trading at a 20 to 30% free cash flow yield using the current oil price. In fact, a discount, you know, I use $60 for round, round numbers. So $3 lower than where we are today. I can buy companies that can theoretically pay a 20% dividend per annum while keeping their production flat. So, you know, the bullish thesis is not in, if reflected in any stocks. They're not reflected in the small caps, the mid caps, the large caps, oil service. Everything is trading so, so inexpensively. You know, if, if you bought the index today, you could do fine. But the, the challenge of, you know, an active stock picker is finding out where can you really squeeze out every nickel you can from the rally that is going to be coming. In, in mm -hmm. months and, and so Eric, what do you think though about investing right now and to your point, like earning an ETF versus actively an actively managed account? It's, it's, it is very different uh, for so many reasons, um, you know, because it does come down to the company fundamentals and how they're positioned, their balance sheets, et cetera. When you look at the company fundamentals these days, what's the one uh, red flag that, would cause you to not invest in the company because you know when you step back and talk about a very bullish outlook that that's great but obviously there's always some companies that you know and this is the concern that might not make it as we wait right. for that price of oil to, to move higher or what have you or for yeah. or even for you know people to really understand what the supply picture might look like because that's not the narrative that gets talked about a lot it does amongst people like yourselves but not a, amongst the general pop populace yeah. Well, we're, we're clearly out of the valley of death, you know, to where the price where the literal, like the oxygen is being sucked out, meaning you're not generating enough cash flow to keep produ your production flat. So production's falling. And that's really like, that's a horrendous place to be. And we were there a year and a month, a month ago at the current oil price, especially with tight differentials that we've, we've seen. It's not a question of, you know, what you look at how much free cash these companies are generating and it's it's my question is well what's the ceo going to do with it so that's my if i don't have confidence that they're aligned you know i put up a tweet this week looking at shareholder or um personal stock ownership relative to comp, to comp. and mm -hmm. you know you don't have to get into absolute levels because you know the large guys you know this a uh, suncor uh, 
a CNQ, you're making seven to 10 million. A smaller guy, you're making, you know, million, million and a half, which is still, you know, you can, you can get by on that. So you look at, okay, well, how much inside ownership do you have? And you look at a, a company like Suncor, and I might be off a little here because I'm going from memory, but the, the gentleman has maybe like 0 0.7 years. So you're making 10 million, like you must have a really lavish lifestyle that when you're making 10 million bucks a year, you can only have 7 million bucks, you know, in total in stock when you're making 10 per year and you've been, they've been there for a couple of years. There, there's some people on the graph that they've been at the company for 15 years and they have like half a year's worth of personal ownership. So looking for alignment, looking to see, okay, you're, everyone's generating free cash at now, like you better be anyways. So like, what are you doing with that? Are you buying back shares now that most companies repair the balance sheets devastation that occurred last year? And they're all there. Like balance sheets are really, really strong for the group. So are you buying back shares? Are you personally buying back shares? Are you contemplating an, either an initial dividend or a dividend increase? You know, are you looking mm -hmm. at scaling up, taking advantage of private equity players wanting to, you know, monetize, get liquidity? Because it's so it's there's it's not just a one size fits all for everybody. Every company mm -hmm. is unique. Some companies should be delivering like a Meg. You know, Meg is trading at a forty five percent free cash flow yield generally. Should they pay me a dividend today, or should they use that delever, which in a year's time will lead to a multiple re rate, and I'll make more money as an investor through that. That that's for them. So there's no one size fits all policy. But going directly to your question, it's it comes down to management. There are mm -hmm. just some management teams that to me are uninvestable. I don't care if I'm buying the stock at like half, you know, 0 0.5 times cash flow. It's just not worth it because inevitably, you know, they will screw it up, I think. So I'm you know, not going to mention who those yeah. teams are, but <laughs> sure. not, if they don't appear in my fund, you know, they might be on the list. Right, right. And, and so, but Eric, with respect to um, where you're seeing the most alignment of management with inside ownership, um, where, what names stand out? Well, on the on the chart, we had uh, clearly Kelt, you know, Dave Dave Wilson. And just a part of it is, you know, Dave's had a, a had a great pass at Celtic that he sold to Exxon, so he 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 did okay by that. But he is aligned, and he owns, I think, he owns 10 ish, 10, 15 percent of the company personally, which is you know not a not a small check to have had to cut. A lot of that was bought in the open market. Uh, Jim Riddell from Paramount of the of the Riddell family, obviously, so fam family money there, but alignment. Uh, you had Bonterra, George Fink, who's been doing this for, I don't know, maybe even 50, 50 odd years. So that he's, he's been in the game for a while. And then you have Cardinal, you know, Scott Rattushny, who they took a pretty big pay cut last year. I think his pay dropped by 45% 2020 over 2019 as their company was not in a tremendous place compared to last year. So that shows alignment when you're willing to cut your own comp. And mm -hmm. he was a buyer of not just the equity, but the debt in the open market last year. So, you know, there's... There's a lot of different variables to look at, but that's one of them. I want my CEOs to, to be aligned and to feel it. Like if the share price falls, you know, mm -hmm. the antithesis of that, I was public on this, was, was Doug Suttles at Incana and now Aventive. So the gentleman made approximately $80 million over five years. And I believe that was US dollars. The stock fell 80% over that time frame. And I did the math on the guy owned at the time, like $1.4 million worth of stocks. So you've made 80. Okay, you have to pay tax, but you own 1.4. So is there alignment? Is he really feeling it? Or is he, you know, you look in the comp structure, he's flying around on the private jet. It's all disclosed, but, you know, you get access to the private jet. You're, you can make, you're making, you know, good money. So are they really feeling it? Are they really that aligned? And I think you can arrive at the, the, the logical answer to that question. So hmm. it, that, that's one of the things. I think alignment, we all talk ESG, everyone looks at the E, right? Very few people want to do the S and the G. It is a sensitive topic. Very few people are willing to take the flack yeah. and, but it's important because- uh, Yeah, that, that's it, actually, that, no, that's a great point. You know, we, we, the ESG, we talk about the environment, but not necessarily the social or the governing. Yeah, and it's, it's the, if you talk to ESG investors of which, you know, they're only 5% of AUM, but probably 99% of inflows. So it's, it's a powerful area of, of capital to try to get back to the energy sector. Cause you know, when you have names trading at three times, four times, they used to trade at eight, it doesn't take much capital to come back to get a multiple re-rating. And then the oil price can see flat and you can still do very well. But you ask them, like, well, it's not just about the, cause the E like Canada, we're in a great spot. We, we're, we're the oil and gas sector is the largest investor in clean tech of any industry in Canada. So I, I've got an article coming on the Financial Post tomorrow 
or the next day kind of celebrating it. And it's like, we need to very loudly be proud about this and, and educate people because people are looking th at our industry through a, a, like a 1990 lens. So emissions reduction, we have oil sand projects today that have lower emissions intensity than the average barrel produced in the world. Why don't we celebrate that? There are technologies on the come that could lower emissions intensity by further 70 to 90%. And we're not talking 20 years from now, we're talking a couple of years from now, like it's being piloted. So in, a, in an undersupplied world, Canada can supply not just the most ethical barrel, but potentially the cleanest barrel, one of the cleanest barrels in the world. So that's that's where my focus has been right now. Like we have unbelievably inexpensive stocks. We've got positive rate of change through pipelines being built, coming online this year, next year, and the year after that. Stocks are super cheap. And when you think about, okay, what do energy investors want? They want return of capital. They want production growth. And so that means like long life reserves, low corporate decline, aligned, strong balance sheets, and the, the global epicenter of that in the energy sector is Canada. And so Eric, when you think about stocks and stock price performance, um, you know, what you've described in terms of the bullish outlook for the price of oil, ultimately that moves stocks in, in my opinion. Um, at the same time, you know, when, when you look across any sector, money flow matters, and you've touched upon that in terms of, you know, where are the energy investors, the institutional investors, people are cognizant of ESG from a pension fund, a pension fund institutional perspective. Um, you know, how do you weigh that, the money flow aspect of moving a stock price with the fundamentals? And, and what does that make you think in terms of the potential return or headwinds or tailwinds? It's, it's a very fair question to ask. And so when I think about valuations, proper valuations of stocks, I don't, I use a fraction of historical trading multiples to represent the, that there is frankly less capital to come in, right? There's a, a saving of the population via, due to energy ignorance or not, they're just not willing to invest. Like my client base is hundred percent retail is the best client base you can have. And you talk to advisors, they're like, well, Eric, like I see the opportunity. I talk to my clients, but some of them say, I just don't want to own energy. Or I talk to my you know, a client's 50 tries to talk to their, their son or daughter in their, you know, their twenties and they don't want to own oil and gas, you know? So there's that, there's just less capital to come in. The divestments from, you know, the Princeton's and the name downs from the Harvard's, et cetera, that's largely transpired, but you basically need the profit motive, the, the FOMO, like the fear of missing out to kick in so much that mm -hmm. people just can't withstand the profound underperformance. And we're kind of there this year, like, you saw generalists coming back and then we had, you know, a new wave again that I think have kept people on the sidelines. But I, you know, fast forward to the second half of this year, which is the only reason why you don't an energy stock system you know, for a post COVID world where demand is normalized and yet supply is challenged. And, you know, energy stocks were the biggest loser last year by far. You just talk about, you know, the COVID trade, I was it, like it was horrendous. So as, as the reopening trade picks up steam, it's logical to think that the stocks that got beaten down the most can outperform the most. And we've, we've mm -hmm. begun that journey, but there's still a lot more to, to occur. So it, I don't think it will take much. Like retail interest in the sector is incredibly strong. Like I see that mm -hmm. through my daily inflows. Mm -hmm. Institutionally, generalists are still on the sidelines. They're not here yet. You know, if they are CNQ, maybe some core, et cetera, if they're really feeling risky, they'll buy a little Snovus. Right. But, they, but the real, real opportunity is down the market cap food chain because that's where you can buy stocks that are at valuations that I can't even believe that I can buy them at. And it's just going to require a bit of patience to see, you know, see that patience rewarded. Yeah, that was what I was going to use, um, patience. And, you know, it's interesting if any, you know, if anything we've learned from COVID-19 that sometimes the retail investor, the individual investor is ahead of the institutional investor. You know, there's been obviously democratization of information and uh, people have more time. Uh, perhaps to actually, you know, think about what they're doing and participate and learn. So um, I, I think it's interesting that, you know, probably the retail investors kind of moved first uh, before that generalist and, and maybe the generalist. So for our viewers to understand, if you're kind of a money manager um, hugging the index, if the percentage of the energy sector increases, you got to kind of play catch up just to not lose if in fact that sector works. That's very, very powerful and people can't forget about it. Yeah, and it and it's important for a retail investor to understand how to make money from that because you know when I look at the holdings that I, I have, my average market cap is probably about a billion and a half, and it's taken me two three months in some cases to amass a position, 
And so when the generalist does want to come and they don't want to just own Suncorp, but they want to own, you know, some mid cap or what, what used to be a mid cap and is now a small cap and what was once a small cap, now a micro cap. And, you know, they say, geez, I can buy a stock of one and a half times cash flow, 30% free cash flow that I'm willing to bid it up because it's so cheap. Well, good luck finding stock because mm-hmm. in some cases, like I, I would own 9.9% of a couple of companies, six, 7% of some others. And if it took me, you know, my ABM small, I'm maybe 335, 340 million right now. But if you're running billions and billions and billions to, to inject enough capital to make it wor- worthwhile is going to be incredibly challenging. And so people would ask me, well, Eric, why don't you own Suncor? Because that's where the first dollar will go. But it's the small guys where it takes far less buying power to want to come in to get that really explosive a rally. Mm-hmm. And it's the reason why we've done we've done pretty well so far this, this year. Like we've we've more than doubled the index, and the index is on course and over C and Q. Mm-hmm. Uh, double the index in terms of performance. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think the index is up roughly 27, 28. We're up sixty ish percent. Okay. Um, and, and just to be clear as well, Eric, your your focus is is solely Canadian, correct? Well, I I look globally, but I've made the decision to be a hundred percent. Uh, invested in Canada today because the real options is Canada US. You know there are some global op- uh, options. We're uh, we're invested in like names like Parix, which is in Colombia. Um, you know Ch- uh, Transatlantic, which is in in Trinidad, small. But the the real opportunity is you know what do energy investors want? They want return of capital. What allows for that? It's long life reserves, low corporate decline, aligned management, strong balance sheets. And as we enter into a structurally tight market, you want that inventory length becomes more and more valuable because there's this worry that we're all driving electric cars in two years. You know, what's the terminal value? What's the value of a barrel 15 years from now? So once that that complete ignorance fades, the value of that barrel 10 years from now increases very, very materially. So I, you know, pre-COVID, you you could see the interest level in Canada was growing. You know, you'd, you'd have notes from Goldman Sachs saying, oh, we're holding a a bus through going through Calgary. And it's really where, where energy investors globally were focused, despite all of the nonsense we've had to deal with for the past you know, pipeline politics for the past five years. Yeah. But I, I really think Canada is going to be front and center because our companies are like world-class, super long reserves, uh, good balance sheets. We're building out 2 million barrels per day, uh, mm-hmm. or sorry, a million barrels per day of new capacity in the next two years. So the prospect of our differentials blowing out, I think, have, have shrunk meaningfully. And you can so, buy names you know, at, yeah. at, at just such ludicrous valuations. So I was going to ask you a little bit about that before we get into some of the names. Um, one is Canadian energy policies. <laughs> so <laughs> where that stands now and how that affects yeah. investing here. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, you could invest anywhere. But I, I certainly do understand that you know, if you really look at the company fundamentals and, and how much... Um, the Canadian companies are, are leading in terms of uh, cleaner barrels. Um, you know, A, where does Canadian politics stand as you look at the companies and, and have to think about that, that potential risk? And then also um, we'll get to the geopolitics, so more international matters. But, but what about the Canadian side? So I, I approach Canada with the belief, and it's my own personal belief, because I you know, don't just represent my own views, but those of the firms that I work for. So my own belief is that our federal government may not be the, the largest proponent of our energy sector, but there's an awareness that with the fiscal hole that has been created from the hundreds of billions of dollars that we've spent from COVID, you need all cylinders firing to dig ourselves out of this hole. And so if you believe that Canada, like I, I don't think we're going to be growing meaningfully as a sector, whether it's for Canada or, or broadly speaking globally, the worries about more pipeline capacity are, are not really valid anymore. Like if this was 10 years ago and companies were really trying to grow, but with the, the extra capacity that we're bringing on with line three, with TMX, I don't think another pipeline will go, get built after TMX with the legislation that the Liberal government put forward, but that's fine. Like there's enough to constrain the differential uh, blowout. So. Yes, TMX, you know, there's been a delay on part of it due to hummingbirds. You know, there's a four month delay of falling oh. trees part, part of it, which apparently is not impacting the, the on-service date, but it's just, this is Canada. Like, there are certain things that wouldn't happen in other jurisdictions of the world. It's part of the reason why we have one of the highest ESG barrels in the world, because we do have 
unbelievably high environmental uh, standards, despite what some you know, you know left left leaning organizations may tell you. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's just that's some of the stuff that we just have to deal with. And mm -hmm. you know, even when I burden my com my companies with higher carbon taxes, you know, higher fuel standards, you know, uh, pipeline, you know, WCS differential around 10, 10 bucks where we are today. Even when I burden that cost structure with all of that additional, you know, layers, their the cash flow and the free cash flow that they're generating and will be generating is so unbelievable that it still makes the stocks really, really mispriced. And you think, well, what's the alternative? It's the US. And also we've got the Biden presidency. You know the EPA is going to have teeth now. The talk of carbon taxes, you know, increased costs of doing things, methane capture and such. So our 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 are, I was going to say discompetitive, but that's not a word, but you know what I mean? Like our, our <laughs> uncompetitiveness is shrinking after a, a Biden presidency. Mm -hmm. um, Eric, I'm curious, you know, when you touch upon um, company managements and um, understanding company managements, how much, and this is important as well for viewers to understand, when you're a money manager, you have access to company managements uh, in terms of conversations, understanding what the outlook is. What, 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 what is your access like these days and, and what sentiment amongst CEOs? Yeah. So everybody's on Zoom now, right? So, you know, I don't have to fly to Calgary nearly as much. I haven't been out there for a while. Um, I'll, I'll talk to my CEOs probably once a month for, for core holdings, just to keep updated. Mm -hmm. See, is business tracking? So I'll have mile markers for all of my companies. So you just try to get a feel, are they meeting those mile markers? Is there a pivot in strategy? You know, I keep very good notes uh, on one note and it's like, okay, well, you told me two months ago that return of capital, you were contemplating this. I'm not hearing that now, why? And so you wanna see if there's, like for a money manager, you always look at for style drift. You know, are they deviating from what made them successful? It's the same mm -hmm. for CEO. You wanna make sure that there, there's not some drift where, okay, oil's gone up, cash flow is going up. Oh, now you wanna grow a little. Now you wanna not return that money to me through buybacks. And so it's, it's just making sure that you're as up to date as possible and getting mm -hmm. a feel for, you know, there's always catalysts, there's always drilling results, there's always new plays. So you wanna stay in the loop on that. I would say guys are okay. CEOs are feeling yeah. way more bullish. You know, many of them suffered from PTSD and that was expressed in some really bad hedge uh, positions that they put on for Q1, Q2 of this year. You know, some were down in the forties, which is mm. just like, oh, like it, it pains me to look at that, but at least you can appreciate where there was uncertainty on vaccine rollout, second wave, third wave, fourth wave, whatever, you know, when was demand gonna inflect? So I'm giving them a pass. But believe me, I'm holding their feet to the fire, looking forward to say, okay, your balance sheet is in check. Why would you even contemplate, especially with where you know oil is a year from now that you could actually hedge? Why would you possibly contemplate hedging that barrel? I'm an energy investor. The only reason I own your stock is because I'm bullish on the commodity. Why would you cap that upside? And I, I think most guys get that. Not everybody does. And so it, it just it's an ongoing conversation. Got it. And um, just before we move into some of the stocks and also questions, um, um, what, what are the thoughts from a geopolitical risk perspective, Iranian sanctions, uh, and what that might mean for the price of WTI or Brent? Yeah, so it, officially it would mean that 1.7 million barrels per day could come back onto the market. Unofficially, like we use a, a service called Kepler, and there's a couple competing ones, but they use satellite imagery to track every ship in the world and every storage tank in the world. So I, I, I'm a big pr student of uh, inventories because that gives you a real time measurement. And so if you use satellite imagery, they would tell you that while Iran says they're only exporting three to 400,000 barrels per day, the real number could be over a million barrels per day. So as hmm. soon as Biden was elected, you could see a massive increase in exports because they were a believer that, you know, Biden's very, you look at who's within his administration, there's a lot of the architects of the JCOP, He's really um, keen to, to reestablish a deal because that was one of Trump's big, you know, former successes. So I, I fully expect, you know, there's about a million barrels per day of real production. The day they sign a deal, all those ships that just turned off their beaker, their beacons, you know, you flip it back on and people be like, geez, you know, there's all this oil on the, on the market. It's already been going through the supply chain for, for many, many months. So wow. the risk is not nearly as big and whenever OPEC does come out with their communique in the next couple hours or tomorrow, I'm looking for language for them to say, you know, Iran is fully, you know, it's their right to bring on production and we will, we will deal with it. We will, we will do what we have to do to make sure that inventories don't ever balloon again. 
Because mm-hmm. remember, as good as you know, my companies feel with the oil price, if you're Saudi, if you're most of OPEC, you are still not a going concern as a nation at current oil prices. So many of them are still desperate for meaningfully higher oil prices than where we are today. Is that, so I always find that somewhat debatable as it relates to Saudi. Um, you know, I understand to a degree that maybe they want to hire from here, you know, for a stronger balance sheet, but we also know that their cost of production is so significantly low versus anyone in the world. So how do we know what the real, the right number is? Well, people would analyze their fiscal break even. You can't look at it as a company because when you're responsible for 70% of state revenue, you also have to be responsible for 70% of state expenses. And so, you know, the math I did a couple of years ago was social. So they would say, okay, our operating costs, they're lo- low single digits. So six bucks. They go, oh, geez, okay, well, it can go to 10 and they're still profitable. Exactly. Their, mili- their military spending per barrel is $20. Their right. social spending per barrel is about 40 to $45. So once you fully burden the state company with their share of state expenses, their mm-hmm. true price, you're in, you're in the high 70s to low 80s for a true like fiscal break even. Got it. Okay. So yes, you, so, you, so- can, you, you can keep yourself going through monetizing your crown jewel. You can take on debt, but clearly you can't do that forever. And you know why would you when we will undoubtedly reach peak oil demand at some point, I think in the next 10, 15 years. And at that point, demand will slowly fall. But when that's so much of your state revenue, in the back of your mind, you've also got to be thinking about diversification. Right. And, and so just on that point, when people say we've, we've seen peak oil demand, you say what? <laughs> I don't believe uh-huh. peak oil demand right now. <laughs> okay. So you look at, okay, where would that peak come from? We're adding 1.2 billion people on this world between now and 2040. So let's call it the next 20 years. That's supposed to represent a 25 increase, 25% increase in power demand generally speaking, all of that growth is occurring in emerging economies where their priority is reliable, uh, cheap access to power. You know, they're trying to get off burning animal dung in their house as their primary fuel for their food. They're not really worried about achieving net zero in the next, you know, 15, 20 years. So Mm -hmm. we can view the world through our Western lens, but the real story is what's happening in, in India increasingly what's happening in China still, what's happening in the, the majority of the emerging economies. And you know, where's the alternatives to oil's demand? 60% is transportation, 40% is non-transportation. Plastics, you know, you should see the pile of Amazon packaging and for all, I've got three oh, kids yeah. out of toy, it's just, it's ludicrous. Well, we're not consuming any less. Um, you know, 27% of oil demand is electric cars. Sure, we will all, because of public policy, be driving electric car one day, but what day is that? Is it five years, 10 years, 15 years, over which time the base of internal combustion engine cars will have grown meaningfully? You know, I, I've had to sit through more hydrogen conferences that I've, I've wanted to the past six months. And every timeline you look at, you're looking 2035 to 2040 before you know, volumes really start to reach critical scale. So yeah, we've got, I would say 10 more years roughly of demand growth. But the real question is, okay, what happens when you reach peak oil demand? Because there's a line of kind of coin. It's the, the fear of peak demand is leading to the reality of peak supply. And while alternatives will impact demand 15 years from now, the supply story is happening in the here and now. And so mm-hmm. if mm-hmm. even when we reach peak oil demand, if supply is falling faster, you can be in an environment where demand's still falling, but the oil price is rising because nobody wants to invest anymore. You could use a board can't sanction a project where it takes six years to bring it on and another four years to reach project payout when nobody knows what the oil price is going to be doing when, because you, know, you have to hear about peak demand or have we reached peak demand. So I, just, I think logic, yeah. demographics, alternatives, actually digging into the details, I don't know how anybody could say that we've reached peak oil demand today. And, and Eric, just to pick up on one point um, that you mentioned in terms of, you know, potentially a supply shock, you said a supply crisis when we first started speaking today. Um, what do you think or people need to be aware of, or maybe what are you planning for as it relates to that pass through costs and the potential to see inflation? There's many other factors that would keep inflation at bay, um, you know, but are you concerned? <laughs> no, I'm hoping for it. My, trust me, my household is very well insured against the price of energy going up. Uh, we, we're most certainly a net beneficiary. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not terribly concerned right now. You know, there's a few of us saying it. 
I'm not alone. You know, I may sound like a, a kook when I'm talking about, you know, supply crisis and $70 oil, $80 oil. Uh, some of our big consultants like Energy Aspects, which offices around the world, very, very well followed. They're calling for $80 WTI next year. And a lot of their arguments are, is what I'm talking about. You know, demand normalization leading to demand growth beyond, you know, pre-COVID levels. But you look supply, U.S. shales challenged, OPEX out of capacity, global offshore is mm -hmm. going into decline. Where are the barrels going to come from? And it's, mm -hmm. you know, as a student of the energy market, I'm challenged to see in two, three, four years where those incremental barrels are going to come from. Right. And I, I hear you. And it would obviously be a benefit to the energy industry. But I'm just thinking for the individuals at home, you know, if you kind of look at the the impact of a rising energy price um, and the input costs, whether it's, you know, chemical companies having to increase their input or getting in, increased input costs and passing that along to the consumer. I'm kind of just asking you, what what do you think the consumer out there needs to be aware of in terms of the potential price increases are the products, the everyday products that they buy. And you're, you're really hearing that from a number of the companies that are already reporting in the current U.S. earnings season. So, um, you know, is that a, should we be mindful of that? And, and if we do see inflation really pick up from the energy price, you know, we have to obviously think about what that might mean for various central bankers around the world. So how do you think about that these days? I'm kind of going off topic from energy, yeah. but yeah, I kind of just solely focus on on energy and I leave the rest of my investment team to worry about some of the other tangential factors. But for, yeah. for a retail investor watching the show, I would say the best insurance policy you can own are energy stocks or the right energy fund to buffer yourself from any inflationary pressures from a rising oil price. Because it's, you know, to use the word inevitable is, is maybe a little strong because there's always, you know, the, the mm -hmm. unknown unknowns. But, you know, the, the bullish call has been de delayed. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been, you know, it, it, it's kind of an inevitability at this, at this point. You can just, the writing is on the wall. It's just a question of timing. Understood. Um, speaking of timing, let's get some of the stocks, uh, some of your uh, largest holdings. You've mentioned a few already, Parix for one, a Meg as well. Um, what are some of the other names that, um, that are kind of on your list? And, and obviously this is all public information. Yeah. Yeah. We, we put it up on our, on our website every, every month. Um, so it's, this isn't you know, selective disclosure, but we were focused on Canadian small cap oil stocks. I don't really have an interest in natural gas right now. You can make money because they'll go up, but I, I really think the generational opportunity is in oil stocks that are trading at such depressed valuations, not because of poor fundamentals, but because nobody cares right now. There, there is apathy, but that's going to pass in the coming months, maybe even the coming weeks once Q1 reporting comes out and you know, companies go from talking about the potential free cash flow to actually putting it in print. So we have big positions in names like a Tamarack Valley. They've been very active in gaining, in bulking up, which is critically important because there's like, there's not many energy funds left in this country and mm. market, market cap matters. You know, you go from a billion to two billion market cap and the number of funds globally that are willing to hold you, and this comes from Raymond James, more than doubles. So you, you can get a multiple rating just from getting bigger and better at the same time, of course, not just bulking up with buying junk. But they now have uh, a lot of running room in, in the hottest play in Canada called the Clearwater. It's a superbly profitable play. Stocks trading around three times for cash flow, free cash flow yield in the 20s. We would own Meg. You know, I think Meg is. I'm not owning it for takeout value, even though I don't think it'd be around for another, you know, let's say, two years. But I get long, long, long life reserves with short-term modest growth, deleveraging that'll lead to a multiple re-rate. Where we, I, I could see the name potentially, you know, potentially doubling, doubling, if I'm right in terms of where oil could go. We recently bought 9.9% of Athabasca oil directly off of uh, the old stat oil, which is Equinor. We approached the company direct and we huh. paid 18 cents. The stock uh, was at 60. It's come back a little because we've had a, a short-term pullback. They're, they've got a debt refinancing bonds coming due February of next year. They're, they'll be in talks in the next month to two months. I'm optimistic giving uh, compressed WCS differentials, $63 oil, and a, a high yield market that's open. They could refinance that. That could lead to, you know, be a positive catalyst for the stock. Stock could easily, you know, I'll use someone else's numbers. Morningstar just came out with a fair value of over a dollar. That kind of lines up with my own thinking. It's sixty dollar mm -hmm. oil. Uh, Perex, super super cheap. They're they're sitting on four hundred million of net cash. So you've got a debt free company 
with exploration upside that you're not paying for because the stock trades at around three and a half ish times cash flow, 20% free cash flow yield. They're growing while buying back 10% of their shares this year. They've bought back 17% of their shares outstanding so far. And their cash is such a problem that it's actually like, as people want riskier oil names, it's actually detracting from them. So mm -hmm. my hope is they'll do a special dividend. Or they've been trying to bulk up. If unsuccessful in the next short while, I'm hoping they'll just do a special dividend, get some of the cash off the balance sheet because it's actually working, I think, in their um, mm -hmm. disadvantage. So yeah, we're, we're, we're effectively looking at names where we see meaningful upside at $60 oil still because they're mispriced. And if we're correct, we'll see 70 later this year and, and next year where we could mm -hmm. potentially get a, get a double or more in, in the share prices. That's kind of our, our strategy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've had a lot of questions on pipelines, but that's not your area per se. Um, no. So we'll leave that one. But a lot of people are obviously curious about it. But, um, but you know, a lot of people are also curious about White Cap, and they're going to be reporting this week. So what, what are your thoughts yeah. about that company? Yeah, I've been, I've been soaking up uh, selling. There's been a big seller in, in the market. I think I've bought 4 million shares the past week or so. And there was, the seller was back this morning for reasons that are beyond me. They've done the best job of anybody of taking advantage of um, a buyer's market. They've bulked up, they bought NALs, um, they bought Torque, they've made two other acquisitions. Um, so they've got, they've reached scale. They're now kind of like that go-to mid-cap light oil producer. They're a net negative emitter because they've got a huge CO2 project. So if you're looking you know, for an ESG investor, it's they're, mm -hmm. they're negative. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, they're a net beneficiary. Uh, stock could be trading, I'm going to cuff this a little bit, 16, 17% for cash flow yield. At 60, I think we would see, um, you know, probably 60 ish percent upside from here. And at 70, the stocks could be potentially a, a, a double. And they're reporting Thursday. Any, anything to be thinking no. about? No, they've, they've, they've been doing the circuits for, and with all the acquisitions, you know, you do a presentation and update and they're very, very accessible. So I'd, I wouldn't expect any market moving news to be coming out, you know, just a reaffirmation that, you know, they're deleveraging, they're bringing down uh, debt. They'll be sub 1.5 times in the near future, maybe another dividend increase. I'd love to see them buy back shares. They historically haven't, they've been one of grants been a little hesitant to that, but my, my hope is that they could start buying back the shares as well, given, given valuations. Got it. Okay. Um, Eric, this has been a great conversation. I love the fact that we're able to have a longer conversation uh, than, <laughs> yeah. than normal. Yeah. It's nice to be able to get into the details a bit, a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Um, well, thank you very, very much. Um, and uh, we'll speak again soon. You, as I mentioned at the top, um, we've had a lot of requests to speak with you. So thank you. We'll get some great feedback, I'm sure. And I'll, I'll send it to you. All right. All right. My pleasure.